Hi, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech. In this video, we're going to do a real simple example of a sim mechanics model of a vibrating mass. So here's the system that we're going to simulate in sim mechanics. So we have a fixed bottom and a side, and here's a little mass, just a little block. And we're going to connect that block to the left edge with a spring and a damper. There we go. Um, so the mass has mass M, and the spring has stiffness K, the damper C, and we're going to do the old magical no friction between the block and that horizontal service. There we go. And so now we're going to go into Simulink and Sim Mechanics. Well, let's fire up Simulink just by typing Simulink here in the MATLAB window. There we go. And what we're going to be using is down here under Simscape and Sim Mechanics, second generation. And specifically, we're going to be using the um, solid element and the rigid transform and a prismatic joint. Now, we'll go ahead and get a template model going by typing in SM new here at MATLAB. And that will bring up a couple things, a template model, which we'll be using quite a bit. And it also brings up a library of elements that is behind the template model. And let's just take a quick peek at that. The body elements here are matching up exactly with what we have in the Simulink browser. So here we are in body elements, body elements. I like using the Simulink browser, so I'm just going to get rid of this nice little graphical interface. And I'm going to group these things together. I'll actually just sort of bin them together and then comment them out with the percent click there. And we'll pick and choose from those elements from the template model as we go along. Call this vibrating masses, or mass, because that's what it is. And there we go. So let's look at these blocks for just a minute. Here under the Solberg configuration, the, this one really only becomes active if we click one of these boxes. What the simulation we'll be using is here under model configuration, and it's defaulted to a variable time step ODE45. Let's just go with five second duration. And there are some advanced options that we'll be using later. Okay, now under the world frame, you know, there's some good information here, but the main thing that's important to note is that you can have as many of these world frame blocks in your model as you'd like. And sometimes you can use this to clean up the block diagram a bit. So for instance, I could right click on this and drag, that gives me a copy. And then I could use that to, you know, again, clean up the diagram. And under the, um, configuration block here, the mechanism configuration, this is where we define our gravity. So right now it's a negative z of 9.8, but let's just make it a, an even 10 in the negative z. Choose whatever strange units you want. And there we go. So let's hook up solid to the rest of this model. Save it and update the diagram. I'm just going to use control D a lot of times instead of that clicky thing. And there's our block. And if we shrink down a little bit with some mouse scrolling and rotate it, we can see that it is indeed a nice three dimensional block. And we can turn all of the axes on at all times. That can be kind of confusing sometimes if you have a complicated model. But for this one, it'll be nice to see all those little red and blue axes. Cyan is reserved for whatever axes are current at the moment. You'll see what I mean in a moment. So there's a nice symmetric view, and we have all these other beautiful views. There's one from the back. We'll go back to this one, fit to the screen. And there you have it. So play around with navigating that a bit if you'd like. So let's move some things around here a little bit. And... Uh, Take a look at our frames. It's always good to explore your frames a little bit. There's our world frame. That's the default name, but I'm going to name it frame zero. I kind of like zero, one, two, three for my frames and everything else. So there's a good reason for that that you may see in another video. 
And when we update the diagram, then lo and behold, it says frame zero in our Explorer, as they call this window. There's our solid frame, and it's completely coincident with the world frame. It doesn't look like it, but it's actually at the center, the geometric center of that block. Here's our editor for the block. And if I scoot these things around so that we can see them in the same view, then we can see that the editor for the block default axes are that you know z is up x is pointing off a little bit to the right and so on and it matches up perfectly with our block that we dropped in there because we haven't rotated it in any way well let's go ahead and edit this block a little bit i can pick all, all sorts of funny shapes there's a cylinder i have to hit f5 to actually update it in the viewer here in the editor i could uh, make all kinds of crazy shapes but the simple ones are a sphere there's my F5 again, but we're just going to use a brick. And let's make the dimensions of this thing a little bit more exotic than 111. Not too much more exotic, about 123 in centimeters. And we'll give it a fixed mass of 0.15 kilograms. And let's make it red instead of this dingy gray. There's a lot of things you can do with the visualization, but we'll just do something real simple here by clicking on this color bar and picking a reddish looking hue. And if I hit F5, oh, there it is in centimeters. So if I fit to screen, there it is. Looks nice. And now I do a control D for my model. There's the Explorer view. Again, I fit to screen and there it is. I've got my world frame coincident with the center of that brick. And let me call it mass one. I just can't help myself. Let's sell a solid. There we go, mass one. Okay. Now, this is super powerful stuff. I highly recommend going into the properties and the block annotation of this mass. And I'm going to actually grab a couple tokens, as they call these things, the actual mass value and its units. And I can add some text to this, my own custom text. So I'll put M equals on there. Pretty exciting. And when we go ahead and say, OK, boom, look at that. I've added this custom annotation. So now I can just look at the front view of this block diagram, this model, and I can see that the mass is 0.15 kilograms. Gives me a nice visual cue so I don't have to go clicking around with all these blocks to see that I've really got it configured how I want it. It's always good to look at your frames. There we are, the frame zero or the world frame. Well, now let's go ahead and play with transformation. So I'm going to uncomment this transformation and just drop it right into here and it'll automatically connect. And let's give it a translation only. Let's go five centimeters in the plus X direction. So when we update the diagram, it should pop the brick out just a wee bit kind of towards us a little bit to the right. So there's the plus X standard axis five centimeters there we go and it looks all good and I'm going to shrink this down so that when we do the control D we can actually kind of see it change uh, on the on the screen so that it doesn't pop off the screen and, and we can't see it boom control D pretty exciting so it just moved there's the world frame highlighted in as cyan let's explore the rigid transform just a little bit it has two ports one labeled B and the other labeled F. B is for base and F is for follower. So the base, the B port, is attached to the world frame. So that means that the B port is exactly the same as the world frame. And let's just take a look at that. So there's the world frame. There's the B port attached to the world frame W. And when I click on B, no change. It really did change, but we just can't see it because it's exactly the same. But now we go to the follower frame, which is attached to the mass, and boom, there's our cyan frame attached to the mass. We kind of click back and forth here, and we can see the two sides of that frame, that transform. Well, we can also do a combined transform, so we can do a rotation in addition to this translation. So let's tilt the, the mass down, you know, 30 degrees in the Y direction. So we're kind of like tipping it towards us a little bit. Standard axis plus Y, 30 degrees, right around that Y axis. 
And then when I do a control D, there we go. I wouldn't recommend doing cord, uh, combined transforms until you get really used to this. So, so we're going to get rid of the translation that was just kind of for illustration. And we're going to rotate that block all the way down onto its largest cross-sectional area dimension there. So 90 degrees. And that's the, the surface that we're going to be sliding it on. And I got rid of the translation so it, now the world frame and the, the center of the block are all coincident. And of course, we need to annotate the, the transform with exactly what it's doing. So we want to say that it's rotating 90 degrees about that y-axis. So there's the rotation angle token, the angle units token, and the standard axis. So there it is. Boom. And so now we can shift those around and add a little bit of our own custom annotation about. Pretty exciting customization. Again, you can just look at the front face of this model and see what's going on. Highly recommended. Well, we need to add in a spring here. So let's scoot this over. And the way we're going to do the spring is with a prismatic joint. Prismatic joint is a translational joint. By default, it will be in the Z direction. And fortunately, we've got that block tipped over. So the Z direction is the direction we want to translate it in. So we'll just drop this prismatic joint in there. Make a little room for it. Change the name. Let's change it to spring one. We're going to add some damping to it too, so it isn't strictly a spring, or or I guess we could say it's a spring with a with a wee bit of damping. So there we go. And it has a base and follower port also. We tie the base of that spring to the follower of the rigid transform, and the follower of the spring to the mass. So look at all these goodies in that prismatic joint. We can specify position or velocity. Look at that, spring stiffness, damping coefficient, the equilibrium or the unstretched length of that spring. We can apply an external force. We're not going to do that just yet, but we will soon in another video. And we can add sensors, all kinds of different sensors. We'll be adding a position sensor in a minute. And there's more exotic things down here, the composite force torque sensing, but we're not going to get that complicated just yet. So let's fill in some of these blanks. So we'll specify an initial position. We'll make it uh, 10 centimeters out. So 10 centimeters in that Z direction. Notice Z is kind of towards us to the right a little bit. So when we do a control D, it should scoot that block a little bit to the right and out. And let's give it a 20 Newton per meter spring. And we'll make the unstretched or the equilibrium position of that spring also equal to 10 centimeters. So initially, this thing will be in a nice relaxed configuration. And we'll give it a wee bit of damping, just 0.5. No actuation. And we'll throw a, a position sensor onto this thing. OK, very nice. Now, it gave us an extra port for the sensor, and it's kind of in an awkward spot. So I'm going to do a Control-R a couple times on that mass to kind of flip it around and get it out of the way. Now let's uncomment that PS to S and scope set of blocks. And the PS to S goes from a physical signal, a sim mechanic signal, to a simulink signal. So it, that's sort of the interface between those two types of, of block sets. Hook it in there to the position sensor, and now we'll have a nice little scope trace, we'll call it position in centimeters, of the vibrating mass. Now, let's annotate this spring a little bit. There's a lot of stuff to say about this spring, right? We have to tell the equilibrium configuration, that initial x0, let's call it. Well, I suppose we should call it z0, but I'll call it x0 just for the fun of it. And the k, the spring stiffness, etc. So here are all the tokens that we need. Look at all those tokens in there. You can play around with this for hours and hours with your annotations. But, you know, you sort of settle on some things you like, and then you stick with them. And we'll jiggle these around a little bit so that they Sort of tell a meaningful story. I'll call this one EQ for equilibrium. And X0. I guess I'm thinking in terms of the world frame, but if we think in terms of that block frame, then it would be Z0, but I'll just call it X0. And then K for the springs constant, and C for the damping coefficient. Look at that. That front face of the model tells you everything that's going on. It's pretty exciting, really. And now we're pretty much ready to simulate. Let me get it all squished down a bit. Now remember, this block is in a relaxed configuration. Its, its initial position is the same as the unstretched spring length. 
So when we do the simulation, you should be able to predict what will happen. I mean, to run the simulation, I'm just going to hit this little, this little green arrow here. So there it is running, and it's not moving. But that makes perfect sense because, again, everything is relaxed at 10 centimeters. So there it is. Pretty boring, but very satisfying that it did exactly what we think it should do. But let's see it wiggle. So to do that, we'll give the initial displacement of the block a different value than the equilibrium. I'm going to squish it in a little bit. So I'm going to compress the spring, make it 5 centimeters. When we do a control D, boom, there it goes. It, it, it shrinks up. It's all compressed right now. That spring's ready to pop. And let's get our scope up there so we can see it wiggle a little bit at the same time that the uh, simulation, that the animation runs. The animation tries to run in real time, which is five seconds, but the simulation runs nearly instantaneously. Well, there it goes. It wiggled. It went back to equilibrium. Made sense, but it's kind of coarse when you look at that trace. The variable time step solver for the simulation took some pretty big steps. Eh, that's okay from a time standpoint, but not very satisfying from a visual standpoint. So let's play around with that configuration parameters area and make sure that the variable step size solver never goes too big with its step size. I'm going to go with 1 over 60, which is just kind of a good visual step size. Oh, look at that looks very realistic. Notice that you don't see a spring, so you have to sort of use your imagination there because it is just a prismatic joint that has some funny properties, but a nice smooth profile. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm just rerunning the animation. It's not actually rerunning the simulation, just the animation. And the nice thing about that is I can change the view and just rerun the animation again. If I had a very complex simulation that took a long time to run, I can run it once and then redo the animation many times with different views. Super powerful. Well, now that we have a functioning simulation, we can play. So I can go in here, for instance, into our quote-unquote spring and reduce the damping. Make it more wiggly by changing it from a 0.5 damping coefficient to 0.1. Rerun the simulation, and sure enough, it's much more vibratory. So those are the sort of fun things we can do with the uh, once we have the simulation put together. So once again, very simple vibrating mass simulation. We used a couple different blocks in sim mechanics that are pretty useful. And my name is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and thanks for watching.